Jonathan. And this is the show where we rewatch the Tudors, or in your case, watch, watch it for the first time yeah. and talk about the history behind the drama. And so the background is that I have another podcast, the Renaissance English History Podcast. And in that show, I talk about other aspects of 16th century England. And I thought it would be fun to have a different show where we went back and looked at the Tudors and talked about what was true and what wasn't. And, and my background is that I really know nothing about history. You know, on one of our first it, dates, it, yeah. you asked me why anybody would actually want to study history. I did. You're I, asking me genuinely. I actually went there and said, why would anyone? Oh, what did you major in history? Why would anyone want to major in history? You gave me a pretty good answer. I it, married you. It anyway. worked. It worked. You got me to marry you. So Wait. No, you got me to marry you. Oh, yeah, that's how that goes. That's what I meant. Um, So yeah, I know nothing about history, except that my wife likes it. So I thought this would be a good way for me to sort of catch up a a little bit on your favorite period of of world history, which is this time. So it's perfect. And they made a, a cool TV show just just for the occasion. And 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 I'm and I have to say that I'm quite enjoying this history stuff a, a little bit. Um, it's you. it's interesting and intriguing, and I can actually like understand for myself why a person would be interested in history. Like it doesn't nice. just seem boring. I was one of those people that just thought it was dates and battles, and who cares? Like I don't care what if this if this king was born in this day. I don't care. But and this yeah. stuff, this history, cool. It's fun. I don't have to remember any dates. And you know the thing is anyone's name. Like what I'm much more interested in, like the Tudors focuses on the Tudor court, right? Mm-hmm. And if that's where all the drama was, and that's great. But I'm really interested in how everyday lives were impacted by the decisions that were made. And it's interesting now looking back at like what was happening at the Tudor court and seeing like how like it's not just about dates and treaties and whatever, but each of these things are are important because they affected millions of people's lives. So Henry having a crush on Anne Boleyn and going away from the church, from the Catholic Mm -hmm. church, impacted the faith, like literally what you were allowed to believe for millions and millions of people. And that's like why it's important. And it still is is with us. Yeah. I mean, still now. Yeah. Like we're not all Catholic. Yeah. Well, not we. Well, England is the Church of England. and it was actually kind of illegal to be Catholic and Catholics couldn't be elected to parliament until yeah. like the 19th century. So enough, enough, okay. ch- enough, enough chit-chat. chit-chat, chit-chat, moving on. So this is episode seven and it's called message to the emperor. And in this episode, everybody's sick. The yes. sweating sickness comes to England yeah. and this actually did happen. There was a massive sweating sickness epidemic in 1528. Much of what happens in this episode is actually true. So we're going to like extrapolate to talk about the sweating sickness and about what it was like for average people and how, what medicine could do for it. it not a lot. And, um, you know, a little bit about that, I think, during this episode. So you're going you're gonna to ask me questions. I am. And we're going to do the spoiler alert. Yeah, just a brief spoiler alert. We're going to talk about the episode. So if you haven't seen the episode, you probably want to watch it first. And, and we're also going to talk generally about sort of future events so you know don't be too upset if we tell you something like henry has more than a few wives like that's <laughs> i think you would know that but yeah anyways so just be warned that that y- y- there you might, might be spoilers yeah yeah so yeah should we get started or did let's you want to say do something? it no you can let's get started all right so i was confused when they went through the recap of last week um Last week I had been confused about Thomas More and Wolsey talking about how, you know, Wolsey could almost become the Pope. And, mm-hmm. and, and now I get it. I mean, I, I, I sort of understand a little better the bigger picture and how if the Pope, you know, was captured and then here we are having Wolsey convening a bunch of people and them giving him the power to make such high decisions he's mm-hmm. kind of putting he's himself kind of. like in the pope seat yeah um, 
And that's sort of, uh, yeah, that's, that's something. He's getting a lot of power. Yeah. yeah. You know, or he was close. Or something. Woolsey also was kind of, um, known for taking the Pope's job when, when he could get a chance to like, in the first episode, we talked it was the field of cloth of gold and there was Woolsey negotiating this treaty of peace of perpetual peace. And interestingly, I just read for something else I was working on that this treaty of London, that was supposed to be the treaty of universal peace was actually the Pope's idea <laughs> so several years kind of before. Yeah. And the idea was to get all these people to agree to having this perpetual peace. And if you had a problem, you would take it to the Pope yeah. and he would m- mediate it or whatever. And Woolsey was like, well, you know what? We should do that, but we should have Henry be the one who's going to be the mediator in certain issues. And like, so out of that, he started doing all this negotiation, like totally hijacked the whole idea. That's yeah. So that's kind of something like, that took a little power. And I get yeah. It. So that's kind of something that Woolsey enjoyed doing. He was Wiley, that Woolsey. Wiley Woolsey. Yeah. The, the son of a butcher. He, you know, he didn't go from the son of a butcher to to cardinal for nothing. Nope. No. Nope. And just on that on that point, like if so, the Pope escaped as we saw and was yes. living, you know, in the in the what, what what do you call it a not a convent but a monastery in a monastery or something yeah. like that. Um, but if the Pope had not have escaped, Wolsey really could have done well for himself. Woolsey was kind of screwed by the Pope escaping in yeah. this instance. Yeah, because he just, he couldn't. And his hands yeah. were tied and the Pope wasn't going to do anything. And oh, it was Yeah, just the Pope was stuck, you know, so, but the Pope was out. So it was like, well, I can't, yeah, that's, that's tough for Woolsey. Yeah. So you, you wanted to say something. There was a, a line that mentioned a headache. Was that like Henry writing or? Yeah, no, he, in the, they showed him having dinner with Woolsey Mm -hmm. and he was talking about different books that he'd read. And he said something to Anne about, you know, I didn't write you such a long letter because I had a headache or sometimes I read too late into the night and it gives me headaches. And, um, there are the love letters that Henry wrote to Anne. Mm -hmm. And in one of them, he talks about how he can't write to her very much because of he has a headache because he was reading too much late into the night and Mm -hmm. it gave him a headache. And it's just funny. Like we actually have these physical letters. Yeah. That's so cool. You you said that like, and they have them in a, they're in the Vatican library. They were apparently stolen from Anne. Yeah. And they're in the Vatican library. And the Pope's like, well, well, Woolsey, you tried to take on my power. So I'll take Anne and Henry love letters. Exactly. And that's how I'll get back at you. Yeah. And then Will Compton, Yes. Did he really die of sweating sickness? He did really die of sweating sickness. And also, similarly to what we saw on the show, remember the physician came in and he said, you let him fall asleep. Why did you let him fall asleep? He can't fall asleep. Yeah. There was the belief, apparently one of the symptoms of the sweat was like that you had this um, complete <laughs> desire to fall, like not even, you, <laughs> you were like forced to fall asleep. Yeah, amazingly tired. Right. And um, apparently physicians did think that if you fell asleep at that point, it could be fatal. And so it was actually in state papers. They said that they thought that part of the reason he died was because he was allowed to fall asleep. And I'm, I mean, do you, do we have any idea now if that was like good advice? Cause just the little, you know, bit about, you know, like health that I know I'm, I'm no health professional, but yeah, I would imagine if one was extremely sick, sleeping might be a good a thing. A good thing. Like, yeah. But I don't know, you know, with concussions, like you're not supposed to go to sleep. So yeah. I mean, maybe I don't know. And there's not, um, I know you're no health professional yeah. either. There's not a whole lot about it there. I mean, the sweating sickness is still debated, like what it even is. People I see. don't So it's not really like know. they found out what it is and they've done. It's not like the black death something. where they, okay. you know, the bubonic plague or whatever. Yeah, Cause no. they kind of know about that. Now. But there were a couple of physicians. Um, the last outbreak of the sweat was in 1551 And there was a physician at that point who did some studies. Also, there was a physician in the, I think the 1485 outbreak 
1489 maybe um that so we have some the guy was john either k or caius and he was at gonville hall in cambridge and he was the president of the royal college of physicians and he is who we have a lot of the information of symptoms Mm -hmm. and stuff from and he believed also that it was thought to be fatal if the patient was permitted to give way to this irresistible tendency to sleep it just made you want to sleep and if you slept you would die yeah exactly and um God, what torture it's like don't go to sleep that would yeah it's like, all i want to do is sleep like, so just a, a description of the disease it the other thing is like it began it was really really sudden so they say like it was like you like the saying was that you could be merry at breakfast and dead by dinner and it could really happen that fast. And so I'm just reading from this from this website that talks about the history of the sweat. And it says it began very suddenly with a sa- sense of apprehension. So you would start to feel apprehensive and have cold shivers, sometimes very violent, and then giddiness, headache, and severe pains in the neck, shoulders, and limbs with great prostration. And then after this cold part, which might last from half an hour to three hours, then you had this stage of heat and sweat and the sweat broke out really suddenly and it seemed like that there was no cause for it. You were just going along being cold and then mm-hmm. suddenly you start sweating. And then the sweat that was poured out after that came out, you got a sense of heat and then headache and delirium, rapid pulse, intense thirst, and then palpitation and pain in the heart were frequent symptoms no eruption on the skin was observed, so it wasn't like bubonic plague where you had the, yeah, the sores. Stuff. And- yeah, and so Caius, the guy, he doesn't make any kind of allusion to any kind of symptoms like that. And then in the later stages, there was either general prostration and collapse or an irresistible tendency to sleep, and that was thought to be fatal if you were if you gave way to it. That sounds horrible. And it would all happen so fast. I mean, it would literally I mean, thank be- God it wasn't like days, but geez, like, I mean... I- can yeah. you imagine how terrifying that no. would have been? Like, and especially like what I think is the craziest part, right, of this mm-hmm. whole thing, is that the, like the first. I mean, I, it almost seems silly to me that the first symptom is apprehension. Like, wasn't everyone in London like apprehensive? Right? I mean, do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, of course you're scared because like you're scared you're going to get it, but then I guess that kind of ramps up. I mean, that's just. Because then you'd be freaking out, like, do I feel more apprehensive? Like, maybe yeah, I'm getting it. Exactly. And it's like. And then also, um, it mostly came in the summer and it would go away by the winter. How weird. Like, I wonder what it was. And then um, it also, I don't know if you remember, but in one of the, when, Hen- when Henry was writing to Anne after she went away to Hever Castle, he said you should, he wrote one of his letters to her, you should be fine because usually men are the ones who get it. And that is actually what they found too, that in general, there was a greater proportion of men Mm -hmm. got it. Um, The best age was between 30 and 40 and few women or children died. Like if you were able to um, get it, let's see. Well, what does it say? It is to be noted that this mortality fell chiefly or rather upon men and those of the best ages between 30 and 40 years. So if you were between 30 and 40, that's that's when you would likely. Yeah. Huh, that's and it says here, this like narrative stronger. accounts this emphasized the susceptibility of upper class men yeah. as well. And so, um, Gosh, yeah. How wild. So it really was like a big, yeah, it was like a big thing. Yeah. And so there was multiple, like many outbreaks? Or mm-hmm. like- yeah, there was like, it came, the first one came around 1485. And then there wasn't anything until around well, 1492, then 1502, 1507, then 1528, and then the last major outbreak was 1551. So every, like, 10 years, yeah. sort of. Jeez Louise. Yeah. God, how scary. It's like, <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't know, like, last summer was pretty hot here. Yeah. At least, like, half the town didn't die. Right. Like, also, apparently, this is interesting, um, there was a similar illness that was known as the Picardy sweat in France between 1718 and 1918. So only just a hundred years ago was the last outbreak of that. And so this was this like a London thing? The yeah, the sickness? English. The there's this was called the English sweating sickness. 
and oh, this wow. wasn't so and it, it wasn't spread a to a European couple places thing. like it was just pretty much going it was on pretty anything. much yeah huh yeah and so i guess also some people guessed some people at the time thought that maybe because it came at the end of the wars of the roses mm-hmm. when henry the 7th came mm-hmm. They thought maybe some of the mercenary soldiers that mm-hmm. he brought from Europe like brought it over. Brought but um it That's didn't... kinda far fetched. Wouldn't it happen every ten years? Yeah, no, well no, I no. mean like the plague was brought by trade people showing up on I the I know, South but Coast. it didn't disappear for ten years and then no. come back. Well it did. I mean different versions of the plague would come and go. So so the next question I have is why get rid of Norfolk? And I guess it, do you think he's just getting rid of people he I think he's just like trying to, to circle his wagons. Just clean house. So this is when Woolsey sends Norfolk back yeah, to his yeah, estate like, yeah, we in need East you to, Anglia. We need you to hang out there. Why? Uh, well, the, we the king said yeah. there's something important. Very important. Wink, wink. Yeah. He's just trying to get um, rid of people who are his enemies. And then I thought it was a cool scene. Like, they showed Henry with all his medicine. Like, he goes over yeah. and opens his medicine chest. Like, that was pretty cool. And... You, when I brought that up to you, you kind of said like, "Yeah, Henry loved his medicine." So tell me, yeah, tell me a little bit about Henry and his medicines. Well, Henry was stuff. actually really hypochondriacal, like, and I think in part it's because, I mean, his his brother died possibly of the sweating sickness. Mm-hmm. You know, his brother died when he was young, and he saw a lot of his friends dying, and um, he was really like, I think. If you're in that position, you could go one of two ways. I, I'm guessing, like doing some pop psychology. You could either go like, okay, well, I could die tomorrow, so I'm really going to have a lot of fun and just be enjoy life and blah blah blah. Or you could be like really hypochondriacal, like you know, and learn all you can about medicine and mm-hmm. blah 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 blah. And he went that way, and he did. He had this whole medicine cabinet, and in some in one of the letters to Anne, he talked about different things that she should be taking, and you know, he. He had this. He had this traveling medicine cabinet with all these different kinds of things. He was really interested in um, the voyages to the New World and the different things they were bringing yeah, the back with the, and the medicines stuff. and stuff. Yeah, and so he he really he really was like that. And he also when whenever there was an outbreak, he sequestered himself like he did in this mm. episode. He really did. At one point, he. Stayed well when a severe sweat hit in fifteen seventeen. He left London for almost a year. Jeez, that's and a long time. At one point, he refused to see ambassadors. <laughs> but of course, this he was kind of even when he was in isolation, it was still a little limited exactly, because he had, he had servants. And like stuff. the guy dropping off the food, and it's like yeah. if that guy is gonna, you know, and then the one yeah. guy like collapsed. Yeah, yeah. It's like okay, well, so much for sequestering. You got the guy bringing your food dying. Exactly. Yeah. And he wasn't about to cook his own food. Yeah, that'd be that'd be funny. That'd be like the comedy, the, the, the <laughs> Tudor's comedy edition. Henry cooking his <laughs> own food. And, yeah. I don't know how to cook this. Yeah, and he um, did have his like personal physician. And when Anne got sick, he sent um, he sent his physician to check on her. And, and stuff I'm like sure that. he still had like girl like concubines or what, they just were the sequestered ones. <laughs> I don't no, I don't really think he did because he was so religious and devout. I mean this this uh, this show makes it look like he's yeah, just having sex with everybody the all the time. That, well, it's everyone having sex with everyone all the yeah. time. It's not yeah, just him. You know, it's like this is a whole different thing, but I really don't know how realistic that is, just because of like people getting pregnant and yeah. hiding it, and there wasn't reliable birth control and reliable mm-hmm. abortions and access to that kind of stuff. I mean, there were herbs that people took and yeah, stuff but like it still that, wasn't, but. And I just don't, any, anyway, Henry was really devout and, yeah. you know, he, he actually, as far as kings and mistresses go, he didn't he wasn't that have bad. that many. He yeah. wasn't like, who was it? The lady, yeah, who, or, the baby me. maker. Yeah. yeah. Anne of Cleves' grandfather, I think. So it's just, it's not a question, but just a mention that was a strange Thomas Tallis scene with like the two girls came in and he like told the one to stay and started making out with her and like, yeah. this is this show's just kind of interesting. They're doing like really strange things to Thomas Tallis. I yeah. Don't, I don't understand it. Um, and then the Naples, the battle of Naples or whatever yeah. that was, like they referred to it. What was like, was that part of a war? That was just was... part of this ongoing war that the sack of Rome was part of. And it, it's really complicated. It's called like the, the Italian States war. And it was basically because Charles Emperor Charles V, mm-hmm came from the Habsburgs and then he also became the king of Spain 
and he had all these dominions and apparently through one of his lines he thought he had a claim to these different states that were Italian states and I mean, it was just I mean, but France had a claim to and so but in general it was like England was somewhat united Yes. France was somewhat united. Yes. Spain was somewhat united. Yes. But like Italy and Germany and stuff were just a bunch of little principalities tiny, like, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. States and they were warring with each other and Yeah. So it was kind of like everyone was trying to consolidate power, yeah. I guess. And Germany didn't consolidate until really like the twenty late nineteenth century, Prussia, all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Um, so anyway, no, I, I think there were just these Italian states that Charles had a claim to and France had, and they were just like kind of fighting, so they were just about, fighting it out. And, yeah. And that's where the sack of Rome came from. And, mm-hmm. and there were mercenaries involved and I don't know. Capturing popes, letting them go. You know, why not? Yeah. And, um, so, making treaties, breaking them. Breaking, making. Yeah. Yep. So I don't actually know a whole lot about that war, but okay. that's what that no, was that's part not of. Your, that's not your wheelhouse, your historic that's wheelhouse. That's not my jam. I, I like the random heckler that yelled at Henry through the through the trees. Yeah. That was fun. And, you know, this would go on, and there was actually, I think we're going to see it. I don't remember. I think later, I think they show her. There was a woman called the Maid of Kent, Elizabeth Barton, and she... Uh, very publicly came out and said she had visions that if Henry left oh, wow. his wife and she was killed, but well, yeah. um, as still, as were the monks who protected her. We know her name now. And yeah, we do. Name. Yeah, the Elizabeth Barton. And so, um, yeah, she's like, there were cases like this mm-hmm. more and more. It reminds me of that saying or bumper sticker like well-behaved women rarely make history history yeah yeah i don't remember who i think it was the king or someone was praying in latin mm-hmm. like is that a would people pray in latin yeah like primarily or do you do we know so i don't know about just your average joe schmo yeah but educated i don't think folk. your average joe schmo would but yeah because the bible was in latin and so you learned your rosary prayers well, that all that sense. kind of everything yeah, and church services and everything was all in latin. yeah so, so like, the way we learn our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name we would have learned all of that in, in latin. latin so when we went to say it that makes a lot of sense then. yeah and then again not really a question just sort of i mean it's a question but not historical like the charles brandon had a weird sex scene that yeah, just seemed know. strange it was like hey we're going along in the story and look charles brandon's in bed with someone and I, yeah. like do you have any clue what's... i i don't know why they show that i okay. mean i'm um i i don't know whether they were trying to show that people were taking comfort for comfort with things uh, with what was going on or what i i do know that charles brandon likely had mistresses because once Um, his wife died, he remarried somebody much younger. Um, and so I suspect he probably, you know, like they, they all kind of had mistresses and stuff and he was part of that. But she wasn't dead. No, she wasn't dead yet. No. Okay. But I think that, you know, it probably, like he was, he was always a womanizer. And so I don't know whether it was just showing Mm -hmm. that and setting, setting up for that or what. Um, but I, I, I would suspect it's just to show that how people were trying to take pleasure in everyday life as long as they could. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Okay. So and just about the the sweating sickness again, because they went back like to it. Just that's like really scary. I think on this outbreak, it was like forty thousand people in London alone got it. Mm-hmm. And so it was a lot of people. It was like a really sad conversation with the king and Wolsey. They were kind of almost saying goodbye to each other. Like they didn't know if they would survive. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. You know, it's also interesting, like people would make their wills and, you know, when we make our wills now, like it's like, okay, we'll we'll make our will because you never know what's going to happen, blah, 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 blah. But people then like would actually wait until they were like on their deathbed and they would make their will. Mm Mm-hmm. And women would make their wills before they went into confinement to have babies and stuff like that. And I just think it's interesting. Like, you were really, like, face-to-face with death, like, a lot. Mm-hmm. And, like, then, too, it was like, okay, well, we're you, you might get sick, I might get sick. Who knows what's going to happen, and we might die. Yeah. Yeah, because you might. Yeah. Um, and the queen got really snippy. With 
with Henry? Yeah, she did. That was something. Yeah. She was telling him what for. Well, I think, yeah, it was because um, he was sending her off to be with Mary for her protection. Mm -hmm. And she said something like, oh, but, you know, your concubine is staying here. You're yeah, well, I know why you're sending me. He's like, why you're sending me away because I care about you. And she's like, you care about her. Uh-huh. Don't act like I don't know. Yep. She's just putting it out there. Well, she was. Do you have any idea what the dream sequence scenes were about? Those just seemed really strange to me. Like, he kept having really weird dreams, like... Just sort of painting the picture of fear. I think it was just drama, dramatizing the fear. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't. I've never read anything about Henry that said he was like prone to weird dreams. And this mm-hmm. is now like the second time we've seen that. The first was with the Anne Boleyn, the Anne thing scene. Yeah. So I think that's just kind of their way just of doing sort of artistic like artistic interpretation and stuff. Yeah. So about the Pope, like I mean, I, I, I about I, the Pope. I'm sure. We, we don't know if he like lived in a tent, but like, what what was his? You know, do we know anything about his situation after he had escaped? He was living in what was it called? Orvieto. Orvieto. Yeah, which is a little town, and um, yeah, no, he he escaped uh, from what he dressed as a peddler mm-hmm. and got out of his castle, Castle Sant Angelo, and then he lived in Orvieto. He took shelter is what they call it mm-hmm. in Orvieto. And then he also lived in, took shelter in a place called Viterbo. And like how long was he in these places? Well, like a couple months. Let's or? see. He returned to Rome in October, 1528. And, and the sack of Rome was in 1527. Okay. So, so like he, wasn't, year he wasn't there bit. for like 10 years or something. Yeah. He, um, no, no. he was kept, kept a prisoner for six months and then he escaped and, you know, lived in those two places and then came back to a devastated and depopulated Rome in oh. 1528. That'd be crazy. No, and it was a terrible, the sack of Rome, like nuns getting raped and like just all, just real nasty. Like mm-hmm. the mercenaries just went crazy. Mm-hmm. It was just like a really bad scene. That's no good. No. And then... So Woolsey went and saw him, or at least in the show. Yes. And the Pope said that he would send, that he wasn't going to make a decision, but he would send his cardinal Mm -hmm. to England to form a court. Yes. And did that, was that a thing? Yeah. That really happened? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was just, uh, Woolsey was the papal legate, and then they were were going to convene a court, which Campeggio... Oh, the Legantine Court. There you okay. right. So it was called the Legantine Court. Yes. Nice. Cardinal Campeggio so and So we can Legantine put a name on Court. it. Lorenzo Campeggio. Was that the the guy he sent? Yes. Lorenzo Campeggio. Well, sorry to Itali- speakers of Italian out there. <laughs> Our pronunciation Manja is pizza, horrible. Oh, just, just stop. Campeggio. So was Anne really sick? Like, was that a real thing? Yes. She and her father both got sick. They don't show her father getting sick in the episode. Her and her father both got sick. That's crazy. And they both And lived. they both survived, yeah. Lucky that. I wonder if they were allowed to sleep. <laughs> right? She was. They showed her laying in bed, so... They did. I presume so. Gosh. And one thing about the sweat also is that just because you got it once didn't then make you immune to it. <laughs> so you could get it again. You could get it. Like, and how bad is that be? It's like, oh, I survived once, and now it got me again. Yeah, like, there are cases where people survived, like, two or three outbreaks yeah. and, like, died. Yeah. How horrible. Just kill me. I'd be right. like, okay, if I get this, you know, I survived twice. If I get it a third time, just just, just stab me. Yes. Just put me out of my misery. Uh-huh, it's right? horrible. And then they mentioned the Lutheran War. Yes. Uh, in Germany. Like... I'm, I'm I'm guessing that was real. Like I I had never heard of that. Yeah. So they're actually the the religious wars, and I mentioned the Thirty Years' War, which is actually later. So that was a bad on me um, when we were watching it. This one was called the the German Peasants' War, or the Great Peasants' War, or the Great Peasants' Revolt. Di- different names, and it was from 1424 to 25, and it 15. started. Sorry, 15. Yeah. It started as um, an opposition to the aristocracy, but it also had undertones of religious yeah, things, all that kind of yeah. stuff. And it 
apparently the aristocracy slaughtered between 100,000 and 300,000 peasants Gosh. and farmers. So it wasn't like a two-sided battle. It was just like people getting slaughtered. Right. Because like they had farm tools and like yeah. the soldiers had come through with their horses and exactly. knives. Exactly. And, and it said swords. that while this was a peasants' revolt, you know, England had a peasants' revolt after mm-hmm. the Black Death and stuff. And so it says, you know, while this was a peasants' revolt, they actually took some of the rhetoric from the Protestant Reformation, which was more about, you know, giving um, power to the people, Mm -hmm. as it were. And so they were, like, kind of taking some of that and using that. And borrowing it. Yeah, yeah. to kind of fuel their their revolt. Wow. Yeah. So then then they had um, the scene with Moore, Thomas Moore, down in, like, in his basement, or or they were all locked up, or whatever, his family. Um, And he was talking to his daughter about how, you know, like, these these evil people who... Mm -hmm. Like, he Moore's really not going to be happy. No, with like Henry leaving the yeah. church on behalf of all of like, yeah. England and yeah, just he seems pretty serious about his he religion and really, his pope. And, really serious about him. And if people want to know more about him, I actually did a podcast episode just on him when he just was on the, Thomas Moore when he was the Tudor Times Person of the Month a couple of months ago, and nice. he. Uh, he is really one thing about Thomas More is that he, he does not bend with the wind. Yeah, he believes he's what he believes. Solid yeah, in his beliefs. Yeah, and I mean he he was beheaded Good for, for him. him. I mean he's you know uh, to to be honest, just he's kind of my favorite person in that we've met mm-hmm. in all of this. Um, I mean he just seems like a. Like a good, you know, I mean, like a good guy. I don't know. He just, he seems convict, you know. He has convictions. He has strong convictions and he sticks to them and he seems, it's just nice. It, it seems like you get like what he's thinking and he's, yeah. he's not well, like he a, he's not a yes to, man. Yeah. He never pretended to be anything that he wasn't. And, in. and he's also not trying out to get stuff, you know, because I wouldn't necessarily call Woolsey a yes man, but he's, Woolsey's out for Woolsey. Yeah. And you know Henry's kind of out for Henry, yeah. and Thomas More's out for God. Yeah, his his interpretation. Well, yeah, for sure, but, what he um, thinks, and I, that's cool. You know, and More also was uh, really liberal in educating women, so he educated his daughter. And to he the seems same like extent. that in, in different ways. Like he yeah. seems sort of very forward thing, well, while, while being like hardcore, mm-hmm. you know, religious and and traditional in mm-hmm. many sense. He seems quite. Uh, forward yeah. thinking like and even like you know i think he's got a lot of beef in recent years because of um i think i mentioned before the wolf hall books um yeah you mentioned they painted him kind of not very yeah good. and people say that you know he he did burn protestants and and he did yeah, strong convictions and he really <laughs> truly saw it as a cancer yeah. that you have to cut out it's, well, it's like, like the it's like the westboro um yeah. folks i mean they I think that they truly believe that crazy yeah. stuff that they believe. Yeah. So you can't you, know. you can't knock people for well uh, looking y- back y- you through can. hindsight. Yeah. You can. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know you th- there's there's I, I think it's respectable that that they believe so strongly. Sure. Or something. <laughs> so do we know? But uh, you mentioned this before. Like Henry would coop himself up, like yeah. sequester himself. So that was. Yeah. I mean, that was a real thing. He'd mm-hmm. be, like, locked in his... Not locked, but he'd be up in his room just all alone. Or he'd go from Palestine. Yeah. I mean, or he'd, he'd leave left, London. Like it said, left London for almost a year or over, over a year. year. Yeah. That's wild. So he would go from palace to palace out in the countryside and yeah. never stay in one place for too long because he didn't Couldn't want... could do that now as, a, as, like, a nation's leader. I mean, like, a, the president leaving D.C. for yeah. over a year. Like So, Woolsey... I guess said he was going to go on a pilgrimage to what Walsingham. Mm-hmm. What's what was like? What's that about? It's what's... funny. I actually just did a Tudor minute on the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham, nice. and it was a shrine in Norfolk that was I think it was Norfolk, yeah, where um, the it had actually predated the Norman Conquest um, in 1061. This woman who had the land around there, she was a widower. No, a widow, obviously. She was a woman. And she had a dream 
where so a series of dreams where um, the Virgin Mary came to her and gave her the exact vision of what their house in Nazareth looked like, where they had Jesus. And she told her to build the exact replica in Walsingham. And it became, <laughs> sounds legit. Totally legit, right? Yeah. And it became this shrine. And interestingly, you know how we can look up and see the Milky Way galaxy I like do, in the yes. sky? Um, back then, they called it Walsingham's Way because it like led to the Shrine of Walsingham. And the thing was, so you would you would um, stop at the one church and take off your shoes, and then you would walk the last like uh, half like mile barefoot. barefoot. Uh-huh. And it was it became they called it like England's Jerusalem. It became it was like the most holy place. Oh, so it was like a big. It was a huge like deal, like really big deal. And people would go for all kinds of things. The most popular reason people would go is for fertility. So Catherine of Aragon went lots of times to try to ask for blessings for fertility and henry actually when they had their first child he went for thanks yeah and then like by the time he got back the kid is dead or uh, something. close but yeah and um so yeah people that was something that it was a, a popular thing to go to hmm. pilgrimage to walsingham and um and for different reasons so that's what he's referring to cool the music at the end that was thomas tallis music yes it was his lamentations i believe it was really beautiful Oh, I'm glad it you liked it. It almost brought a tear to my eye, and I can, like, for the first time, understand why you like that music. Oh wow, it's really pretty. I really, I really got into that. It touched me. Wow, it's that's special. great. So, that was neat. And also, oh, I, it's not Anne, but the actress who plays Anne, or she has beautiful hair. <laughs> like that last scene, it was just like God. I never noticed how beautiful our yeah. hair was. So, yeah, she could be on a hair commercial. All right, so yeah, that's so that's, that's my part. What, what, you, what about your your overall themes? Or well, I think anything? it's just interesting to talk about medicine at this time. I would, like that's kind of like the the piece of like how this relates to everyday life is looking at like one thing about this time is like we also saw them bleeding, bleeding. Um, yes. Yeah, and you know, that was a really common thing was to be bled even, uh, you know, until relatively recent times. Mm. And so, you know, that, that was the first recourse was to, to bleed the toxins. And they still went off of God, the idea of, you and stuff. I mean, they went off of the idea of your humors being unbalanced. Mm-hmm. So it went off of the Greek idea that there were four humors. And when you got sick, it was just something in your humors where one humor was stronger than the other. And so the idea was to try to get your stuff back to, That's so crazy. but you know, it's not so much because like we talk about today, like detoxing and you know, even when, no, when know, like I you, go to acupuncture, but you don't you take have, like a quarter of your blood supply. No, no, no. Body. There's that part's crazy. But yeah. But just the, you know, no, I the, think, the idea of being in balance makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I taking a quarter that. of your blood supply doesn't make a lot of like sense. Like chopping up your back. Like the dude, that yeah. was just too much. He's like, okay, we're going to cut his back now. Cause I've heard this works. And yeah. it's like, you know, I just was reading a book where um, it's set later. One of the children of uh, Charles the First was set after the English Civil War, and basically one of the children died because she was bled too much mm-hmm. and it made her weaker. And then, like several months later, another another child got um, the same. Well, she was grown up by that point, mm-hmm. but one of the other children got similar sickness and they wanted to bleed her. And she said, no, 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 I'm not, I refuse to be bled. And like, they were talking about how she made such a big deal out of like, she wasn't a good patient and she, you know, all this kind of stuff, but the refusing to be bled was actually probably what saved her life. Yeah. So, so anyways, sorry to end on a, on a down note. <laughs> Happy 2017, Happy 2017. Everyone. Yeah, so Tudor medicine, I'm really glad we have modern medicine now. <laughs> Me too. And, um, yeah, so we'll be back pretty soon in the next two weeks or so. Hopefully, yes. And um, we're actually going to be apart. We're going to be on different continents. But, but we'll we're do gonna, this via Skype. Yeah, we're going to try and do this intercontinent. We're going to do the next edition will be intercontinental. Yes for for our uh, listening audience so thank you <laughs> thank you for listening thank you all for following happy along 2017 with us and happy oh and watching. go to watching the tutors.com for more information and if you like this show please leave us a rating on itunes yeah, that's the best way to help all people right. find us <laughs>